Good morning, flock. So we're about to get started with our morning keynotes. I hope you've all had a chance to grab some coffee and maybe a couple bites to eat from the refreshment table out there. Before I bring up our first keynote speaker, just a few FYIs. Uh, tonight, we are going to be in the Strong Museum of Play, which is a short walk from here in the Hyatt. Uh, but it's going to be a really great time. We've got the whole museum booked out. Doors open at 6, so you're welcome to show up anytime after there. Full dinner will be provided, so make your dinner plans for the Strong. Uh, we'll also have full access to their arcade cabinet hall. So there'll be lots of fun things to do throughout the evening. I hope to see you all there. Um, other things to know is that the quiet room today will be unavailable during breaks. If you didn't know, we had a quiet room that's all the way back in the corner there. If you need a place just to decompress for a little bit or get some downtime, that is a place that's meant for no conversations, but you can find it there. It just won't be available during breaks and lunch. Uh, other things to note, there was something else. If it comes back, you'll see it in the flock announcements room, which you should be hopefully following along. Any important things that we have throughout the day will be shared in the flock announcements matrix room. But I'd like to go ahead and now, uh, Troy. Oh, that was it, thank you. The group photo. So we are gonna do it in the strong tonight. And the suggestion is if you'd like, uh, I encourage you all to wear your conference t-shirts uh, for the group photo tonight. We're gonna do it there at the strong, probably a little bit after we start, after you all get a little bit of bite to eat but it will be tonight at the Strong. Thanks, Troy, that was exactly what it was. Brendan. Our to get into the strong? Uh, I suggest bringing it, it's not a requirement, but it just helps, you know, people also, names to faces, it always helps too, but it's not a, you don't have to bring it. It'll help us though. And was it Kevin? Yeah, uh, we have to sit in the exact same spot we sat in <laughs> <laughs> We might very well might use those same stairwell, we shall see. Uh, but with that, uh, really quick, Pro I'm going to say probably seven-ish. It'll be, it'll be probably after, or no, um, we'll see when the food is all served, but it'll be after dinner, basically, um, before you all have access to the full access to the arcade cabinet hall. Um, so it won't be too late. But with that, I'd like to go ahead and welcome our first keynote speaker for the morning. Pat Rehecki is here, and he's going to talk about it's okay not to know things. So please give it up for Pat. I'm good. Yep. Good morning. So, I'm Pat Rehecki. I sit on the board of directors for the CentOS project, but I'm at a Fedora conference, so I'm using Fedora branding and a Fedora email address. So, quick disclaimers, a little bit of paperwork, this is the way my, way my life is. I am not an official spokesperson for Fermi Research Alliance, Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, the Department of Energy. This presentation is not an endorsement of any technology, software, service, or organization. <laughs> my life is like this. <laughs> so the title of this presentation is, It's Okay Not to Know Things. And for a probably non-significant percentage of you, your immediate response is going to be, yeah, Pat, you're totally and utterly wrong about this. My experience has been nothing like that. So why on earth should you listen to me since I sound like I'm wrong? Well, let me level with you. I'm playing on easy mode. I am a heterosexual white cis male with an English sounding name. I am in meetings with international collaborators all the time. And when I speak up, people stop talking and listen to me. When I ask questions, people go to the bother of trying to answer them. And what's perhaps strangest of all, when I ask questions about a service and I get an answer, people then credit me for the answer to the question that I asked. This happens more often than you would expect, and I do not understand it. So additionally, English is my first and native language, which means that I can RTFM. I, in the last two weeks, I have programmed in Shell. I know why it says ESAC on that line. I have programmed in C. I know what FNDEF means. I have programmed in Python. I understand that it's get getatter, not getatter. I programmed in Ruby. I know the difference between a for loop and an each loop and the fact that they are equivalent. <laughs> this is the nature of our industry. It happens primarily in English, whether or not English is your first language. And this gives me a huge advantage. Additionally, I had a middle class childhood. I was on the internet in 1993. 
when, in the year 2000, I had a computer that was mine in my room. It ran DOS 3 and played none of my games, but it was my computer. I had highly supportive parents. They put that computer in my room. They bought computer books for me when I was in high school, and I asked nicely for a $50 technical manual. And my wife is super wonderful and supportive. I love my love. <laughs> I am here on vacation. My time card says that I am not working this week and that I am off having fun. <laughs> and she is okay with that. So a little bit of background on who I am. I'm a free software hippie. This means a lot of things to a lot of different people. I failed to install Windows 11 because it asked me to create a Microsoft account and I would not do it. <laughs> I would love for my laptop to have zero binary firmware blobs. I stare angrily at my phone when I get a new one and it demands that I sign into a cloud service. This is the way life is. So I sit on the CentOS board of directors. I'm listed as co-chair of the project, but I need to make a brief aside here. When we had our election for oh, chair, Amy received 56% of the vote. I received 27% of the vote. So to call me co-chair implies that election was a lot closer than it actually was. I was the scientific Linux release manager for SL4, 5, 6, and 7. Woo. Yeah. When I joined the Scientific Linux team, we were number 19 on DistroWatch. That was awesome. I work at a national science lab, so we're primarily interested in prove or disprove rather than produce a product. And I love my job title. I'm computing support specialist. Uh, I am not systems admin. I do not lord my power over the machines. I am not a developer. It is not my job to tweak and modify the machines. I'm not a DevOps engineer because no one knows what that title means. <laughs> and I have degrees in philosophy and theology, not computing, which gives me a strange perspective on these things. So I got some hard truths for you. Your teachers lied to you. <laughs> there is such a thing as a stupid question. But let me be clear, a stupid question is one that you ask when you don't care what the answer is. Those questions are dumb and a waste of everyone's time. Stupid questions are context specific. If I said, hey, is Fedora gonna support OpenRC? Because I wanna rant and complain about systemd, that question's dumb. If I wanna, ask, if I say, hey, is, system, or is Fedora gonna support OpenRC? Because I would like to learn about how the systems boot and how does the init RD hand off to the running system? That is a good question. Stupid questions are not rhetorical questions. If I ask you something and I don't care if you respond, well, if it's, if it's a flourish, it's a fancy way of speaking, that's not stupid, it's just distracting. Stupid questions are not teaching questions. If you have a junior admin and they're trying to SSH into a box and it says, the host key is different, what should I do? Well. Ask them a question. Did we change anything on that machine? If they say, well, we did reinstall it. Well, follow-up question. Would that made a difference here? <laughs> so teaching questions are great, and they're not stupid questions because you care about them trying to answer. This basically boils down to the fact that if you care about the answer, your question is not stupid. You should ask it. Depressingly, some people are gonna judge you for this. This field attracts know-it-alls who seem to think that they're in competition with the rest of us to know the most things, or at least to know the most interesting things. That's kind of weird. Um, we're not in competition with each other to know stuff. We're in competition with the silicon to get these things done, and we're in competition with the large language models to make them not make us all crazy. Computing work, though, is about knowing specific things. And people seem to make the mistake that just because you are uninformed on a topic, you are therefore bad at your job. That's fundamentally not true. If no one told you that Web35 runs the database server in the background, it doesn't make you bad at your job for not knowing that Web35 has a database server on it. This is just a question of information. 
It's also a question of mindset. School generally taught you that you need to know how to repeat this process, fact, or idea, and that makes you a good student, which means you have the idea that knowing something and not knowing something is the difference between success and failure. But the truth is, in computing, your job is to help. If you're a developer, you help processes work better through coding. If you're so in a support role, your job is to help users solve a problem with tooling. All of these start with the word help, because that's what this industry is for. Your job is not to know. Your unapplied knowledge is totally worthless, and they're not paying you for that. They're paying you to help your users. So let's talk for a brief minute to early career folks. It is impossible to know everything. The x86-64 syscall table has 410 entries in it. I don't know what the vast majority of them even are. If I were put to the test right now, I could probably name 12. glibc has 3,134 features to make your programming life easier. That's not the only object that this project produces. You do not know what all of it does. If you're into Python, well, there are 480 modules in the standard library. I know three. <laughs> this is a lot to know to just get off the ground for basic development, which is why you don't know it to get off the ground for basic development. If you're in a support role, the RHEL 9 configuration, uh, basic system settings doc is 132 pages. And let, let me level with you. If you're in a support role, I expect that you know every single thing that is in that doc, and this is the first time I have ever asked you to read it, so it is fundamentally unfair of me to expect this. It covers things like user IDs need to be unique, group IDs need to be unique, here's how you check if a service is running, here's how you start a service. These are straightforward systems admin tasks, but if no one told you to read this doc, it's completely unfair of me to expect you to know what it says. Or let's take a look at an actual operating system, CentOS Stream 9. BaseOS has got 938 packages. AppStream has 4,779 packages. You don't know what they all do. You don't know how to install them and support them. You don't know how to run them in the system. But if your job is systems administrator, you're going to be manipulating these and doing stuff with them, and you don't know what they are or how they work. So here's how the real world actually functions in my experience. Early career folks get jobs because you're teachable. You're not expected to know things. Anyone who expects a new hire to come in on day one and know the systems is going to be wildly disappointed. You have to learn basic stuff like the site infrastructure. These are the web servers. Those are the DNS servers. These are the auth servers. You need to learn the best practices. Every site has a different set of standards and policies, and you got to sit down and learn those. You gotta learn how the systems are used, how they relate to each other, and when the DBAs say you can have 32 persistent connections, and the web app folks say, well, I need 64 persistent connections, you gotta figure out who gets to be right about that and what you do about it. This is all learning stuff that every person from every job is expected to do on day one. And so if you're early career and you're freaking out, this is what we expect of you. We expect you to not know these things. And that really brings around a simple set of questions. If you need to learn about the site-specific systems, is not the fact that we're running Postgres and you don't know what that is a site-specific system? It seems unreasonable that you can ask where these systems are, but it's somehow embarrassing to ask what these systems do and what the software on them is. People behave like technical questions about technical things can be embarrassing to ask. The fact is, if you're afraid to ask how you do your job, that's a bad sign about your work environment. So when I started working on Scientific Linux, we were number 19 on DistroWatch, and yeah. <laughs> and I did not know how to use mock to set up a build environment. I did not know how to build a multi-labium repo. I did not know how to build install media. I had written one spec file, one kickstart. I had never GPG signed an RPM, and I had never applied a patch to a spec file. Those of you who are Fedora packagers are like, dude, I do this all the time. Yeah, so 
I'm working on developing an operating system and I do not know how to do the basic stuff. Uh, Troy might remember it differently, but for the week that I sat there with him, basically every time he stopped talking, I had to ask new questions. <laughs> because I desperately needed information, because I did not know how to do this job, but I had been hired to do it. So early career folks, this is your big picture stuff. There is too much to know. Your primary responsibility is to ask good questions and apply the answers. And your secondary responsibility is to help others ask good questions and apply those answers. Trying to answer these questions will help you figure out what you do and don't know. But fundamentally, your job is to help. You help computing problems get fixed. It's almost always an information-based problem, and you almost always don't have that information. Because if you had that information, you'd have solved the problem. So middle career folks. That sneaks up on you. Fun fact, uh, we had a summer intern this year who was born after I had achieved a basic mastery of the SE Linux tools. How did I get this old? <laughs> so as a middle career folks, you need to answer questions, so you're going to have to figure out how to enjoy answering them. It is the fastest way to figure out whether or not you know what's going on. But the thing is, just because you're middle career doesn't mean you need to stop asking questions. Everything is changing all the time. And so in many ways, you do the same thing that early career folks do and keep asking questions. Which brings you to imposter syndrome. Um, middle career folks, we have a ton of background knowledge. And it doesn't seem to be worth all that much. I can write an XORG config right now from memory. The thing is, though, I'm using Wayland. <laughs> I am an expert and I am a beginner. We had a problem with a tape drive system at, oh, at the lab. So they said, Pat, when I run a st status command on the tape drive, it returns an I.O. error. And I say, all right, cool. How do I replicate that? And they say, Pat, when I run a status command on the tape drive, it returns an error. Because uh, here's the thing. I didn't know you needed to use the MT command to talk to the magnetic tape. And I did not need know that you needed to use the MTX command to talk to the robot to move the magnetic tape. And they're coming to me for help. <laughs> this is the root of imposter syndrome. I used to learn new things constantly all the time. Now I learn edge cases. And the edge cases don't feel like new knowledge. But they are. So remember to just stay humble and don't be afraid to do your job. That's super unhealthy. Learn your limits and just be honest about it. Once I told the tape staff that I had no idea how to ask the status thing, their response was not, Pat, what's wrong with you? And I was like, oh, OK, you need to run these commands. So breathe. This is the way it works. So big picture for middle career folks. This is the same slide as for the early career folks. <laughs> because here's the thing. When your job title is sysadmin4, it's the same job as a sysadmin one. We just expect you to do more stuff. The rules haven't changed for how you do this job and how you get good at it. Ask good questions. Help others ask good questions. Apply that information. And don't be afraid to do it. So all together now, it's OK not to know things. It's not just OK, it's expected. Ask questions, because we all need answers. Don't be afraid that you're uninformed. I deliberately avoided the word ignorance here, because we use that to insult people. And when no one told you the information that you need to know, it's unfair to expect you to have it. Don't be afraid of this. It's how life works. Unlike the goddess Venus, you did not burst forth fully formed knowing how to be a sysadmin, knowing how to be a developer, knowing how to track these tasks. We're not in competition with each other for who knows the most stuff. We're in competition with the problems that our users have. And we're all in this together, and so we need to act like it when we feel unsure what's going on. So, questions. Troy. <laughs> 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 
Now? Yep. Oh, now. Um, many of this sounds a lot like a person both of us know. <laughs> and I started crying halfway through this. Is this influenced by Connie C? Very much so. Okay. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Connie was effectively the founder, originator, primary driving force, and by force of will kept Scientific Linux up and running. Um, Connie is great. Connie was intensely patient with me when I had no clue what I was doing. I forgot my question, actually. Sorry. Anyone? Um, like she's, she's not dead. <laughs> <laughs> she is retired, and I miss her. So uh, you didn't say anything about the end of career people. Does it get any easier? I haven't tried that yet. <laughs> so I, I try to only speak from my experience. I haven't, I haven't gotten there yet. I don't think I'm late career, but I was surprised to discover that I was middle career, so who knows? Uh, what are the best ways to incentivize uh, people to, uh, to help, the, especially middle career, to help their juniors uh, along? I, I mean, other than the joy of doing something nice. I don't know. That's fair. <laughs> I think most of the things that you talk about relates a lot with the fact that in technology there is a high percentage of people that did really bad at official educational systems. And I'm wondering how we could change things. Okay, so you point out what is wrong, and I ask what could we do to make it better? Well, I can say from my experience, the various Fedora project communication areas, I haven't seen anyone say RTFM in a long time. And it, it, it's a matter of culture where we're willing to talk to each other about things that we don't necessarily know and understand, but we're interested in. Uh, a lot of my experience in computing is we do this because we're interested, and not necessarily because they pay us, though God, that's nice. <laughs> but like, I, I'm here on vacation because I love this community. And so to find a thing in this area that you love, and to be honest that you love it, Um, so uh, when you were talking about there are no dumb questions, you mentioned how teaching questions can be helpful and in the context of your talk, right, that's being on the other end. Of, if someone's saying, I don't know something, can you help me, then you on the other end want to be able to reply. Do you have any tips on how to ask teaching questions? Because I feel like it can be easy to just, you receive a question and you just ramble on and it'd be cool to be able to give some teaching questions to help them think through it themselves? I find generally you, when you're looking at a problem, you know, okay, step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, and step, step five is our solution. So let's ask the question that I know the answer to for step one. It's like, okay, SSH is behaving weird. What changed? And I've been doing this forever. We reinstalled the system, the host keys have moved, we need to drop known hosts and we're gonna be fine. But to sit there with your early curve for folks and ask them question one that you know the answer to. That first piece of data that you use for troubleshooting, to rather than do it internally, to say it aloud, and ideally with a question mark at the end, but at least to talk about your solution process and not jump through it. I feel like I'm out of time. Oh, Jim. No, you've, you've still got one more. Okay. The question that I would ask you, you, the way that you frame this, you were talking about engineers helping other engineers. I, I love that. 
I feel like a lot of us have managers that have hard deadlines breathing on us to get things done. And it becomes a bit of a, a cultural push. So how do you help manage up and force or encourage the manager to develop that type of mentoring culture? I would start by effectively asking them teaching questions up the line, but more about business processes than about techno technical stuff. It's, all right, we need to get these microservices off the ground. Okay, I hear you, boss. Let's roll that. Which one of these is our mission critical service? And they're going to say, like, we both know it's auth. Got to make it off. Okay. What staffing do we have on auth? Are they dedicated? And they're going to say, we have three people. None of them are dedicated. Okay. Can we talk about how we realign these resources? Because right down here in the trenches, you can see my ticket queue has 65 entries, and none of them are for auth. <laughs> so how do we talk about the questions that they're looking to answer? And so our upward management folks typically do business processes. And so we have to treat business processes like systems troubleshooting. Uh, my, my background is in philosophy and theology, and so I, I would argue that every organized system is in fact the same, we just have different inputs. And so the engineering things are about technical bits and bytes, and the business processes are about market force bits and bytes. But at the end of the day, they're still, these items are related. How do we get questions into their hands that talk about these processes in a way that makes us engineer folks happy? So um, let's thank the speaker. Okay.